Let me begin with a question for Hassan. And to make life easy, I'm going to read from an article that you posted on Ijtihad Reason uh, just last month. Uh, and here's what you said. The longing for freedom, justice, and opportunities for individual and collective progress are innate traits of human nature. They are universal values despite disparate attempts at obfuscating this self-evident truth. Interesting phrase. Um, whether these attempts, attempts come in the form of a cultural relativism, relativism that postulates that Sharia, however ill-defined or undefined, is what motivates the individual and society in settings that are thus reduced to being labeled Muslim, or whether these attempts emanate from a variably camouflaged cultural elitism that predicates the appreciation of universal values on the successful completion of English language college level courses on Locke, Hobbes, Burke, and Jefferson. And you go on to say, no, no, no. The young men and women who are defying a generation of authoritarianism in Egypt are seeking, through their actions far more than through their words, the dignity of having an authentic say in their fate and that of their country. Uh, that is a very strong statement of the universalist proposition, if you will, and a very strong denial of the culturalist ant antithesis. And so my, my question to you is, given your strong statement, what role, if any, does cultural distinctiveness or cultural difference play in the events that are unfolding before us in the Middle East and North Africa? Thank you, Bill. The short answer, I would say, is virtually none. But then I would qualify it. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> none because, clearly, if we are to judge, again, here we, we're talking about, let me actually back a little bit before talking about the current protest to tell you what options were available for the individual and for society in the Middle East prior to these momentous events. The options were three. Autocracy in the form of regimes that impose a very heavy hand in terms of dealing with societies and with the individual. Theocracy in the form of an opposition that says the reason we fail is because we do not adhere to the principles of our religion, which is equal to our politics, one and the same, etc. And consumerism in the form of listen to music, buy Western products, enjoy life. These were the three options. There did not seem to be a fourth alternative. So there is no articulation of a fourth alternative. Everyone assumed the fact that these options existed the way they were in the public discourse, that what is available to the individual and to societies in the region is limited to these three. What the events demonstrate in a, in, a, in a way that is really irrefutable is that regardless of what was available in the marketplace of ideas, what people had in them is different. The way to read it is to see at what kind of statements, what kind of slogans, what kind of uh, uh, basically words were used in the course of these protests. And I would not limit them to Tunisia, Egypt, or even Libya, Yemen, Bahrain. But I would go all the way. There, there has been, with, with the exception of uh, Syria and Saudi Arabia, every other Arab state or state where Arabic is used as a language, as the main language of communication, has witnessed severe protests, one that question the hegemony of these three modes that were available. But let's read, not the texts, because the texts are not available, but let's read the actions. What kind of slogans were used in Tunis? What kind of slogans were used in Cairo? What kind of slogans were used elsewhere? We will notice that neither the autocrats, nor the theocrats, nor the promo promoters of consumer, consumerism were the ones that provided the language. The language was self-generated, and it reflects the universal. So that there's always a question of a cultural dimension to it, the way the universal is expressed, but the values that consistently, even in a place as locked, as under control by a totalitarian regime as Libya, 
The slogans were, we want freedom, we want dignity, we want a say. If these are not universal, I do not know what is. Thank you. Uh, Abdul Rahman, uh, this has been an extraordinary day for your country, yeah. at least in the American press, and I suspect also in your <laughs> country. Uh, you are from Oman. Uh, grew up there, uh, although you've traveled abroad, you've made your career there as, as an intellectual, as a, as a public servant. Uh, it's not a country that shows up prominently in the American press all that often. So as I was riding up on the train today, I opened up first the Wall Street Journal and then the New York Times, and lo and behold, two major articles about Oman in the same day. Uh, let me just read short selections and then invite you to comment. Uh, the first selection is from the Wall Street Journal, headline, Oman removes powerful economy minister. Uh, Dateline Abu Dhabi, uh, Oman on Monday removed the country's powerful economy <laughs> minister and its interior minister in a third cabinet shuffle since last week, aimed at ending daily anti-government demonstrations by meeting protesters' key demands. The reshuffle was the second in two days in the Arabian Peninsula monarchy of three million people as the government seeks to quell unrest that has led to at least one death and was sparked by revolts in other Arab countries. And then farther on in the article, hundreds of protesters in Oman's cap capital, Muscat, and the northern town of Sohar have demanded an increase in the minimum wage to 500 Omani rials, which is $1,300 a month, legislative powers for the elected Majlis al-Shura, now a purely advisory body, and the replacement of most ministers. This is known as upping the ante in the language of <coughs> protest. <coughs> and then, on the op-ed page of the New York Times today, uh, a piece by a young assistant professor of linguistics uh, at the Sultan Qaboos University. Uh, and here's what she had to say. Never would I have thought that just a few months later after the celebration of the 40th anniversary of the accession of his master's D. Sultan Qaboos bin Said to power, uh, that Oman would find itself part of the youth quake now sweeping the Middle East. And, uh, and she asked, so what happened? And here's her answer, and then you'll give me your answer. She said, there's a clear disconnect between Oman's forward-thinking government and the young people who grew up with, and thus take for granted, free education and free health care. Somewhere <coughs> along the way, the older generations of Omanis forgot how to talk to our young, to instill responsibility, to share our story of the trials and tribulations we went through to make Oman not only one of the most beautiful places in the Arab world, but also a better place to live. In our zeal to protect a generation from the hardships of the past, we failed to impart a sense of appreciation. In other words, the young people don't understand how good they have it. That's her explanation. What's yours? The only thing different than is completely than uh, Hassan. One well, interesting because Oman was in the journal, uh, American uh, press was I am was when uh, during September. Oman actually was in relation to free American citizen was in Iran. Mm -hmm. When they just informed me that is Oman was actually involved. And now again, when I'm in America, now this uh, again the press. But what's in Oman, it's in fact in, in the Gulf or in the Arabian region com uh, specifically, it's, is, I am suspecting this is would be happened. Why? Because m about, 70% of the population nearly under 20 years, say the quite young generation. 70% of your population is under 20 years of 20 age? Years. That's extraordinary. Yeah, and you could suspect this is in Emirates, in Saudi Arabia, and on all the Gulf, even I am suspecting this is in Yemen. Mm -hmm. If we can say 
25 years under this is qua so this is qua it is a gap between the older generation and young generation and it's, it's you, you 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 don't find that is in the middle middle uh, who could fill the gap between this old generation and the young generation and this is one uh, uh, the main problem is demography in the gulf the second thing is what is in Oman is the employment. So you have to create, it's like the machine to create a new job for this a new generation. You, you could imagine they immediately, if, uh, each year, how many people immediately after they finish their secondary school, they need a job. Or they go to university, after the university what? They have to get a job. So you say that is, there are only three million in Oman last season. That is, this is not the result. The result, how to provide or to how to create a new job for them. So, and this is one thing. And also, the second, the expiry rights, it's a quite a huge number in this, in this region. So how to make the implement, uh, balance between the expiry rights and the citizens, this is one ma major situation in the place. If you look for Oman, what they ask, Hassan, he mentioned about the dignity, about the democracy, uh, which is in actually in Tunisia and Egypt. In fact, I suspect also in this is to be happening in Egypt and Tunisia. Once I remember American he, expert, he came to in my office. I, he asked me about the democracy in this in the Middle East. I told him if it would be happen, would be in three places, either in Egypt or Tunisia or in Morocco. He told me why. I told him because the civil society. Mm -hmm. This is an important, and also the educational and the higher education in these places is, and the middle class is quite high, high, high number in the other places. If you if you can make comparative, yeah. then in all Oman, most of them they ask, we love the sultan, but we need some reform. We need some uh, new jobs. So the main, uh, the main issues was the job and, uh, and the salaries. And some uh, facilities <laughs> can't be given by the, minister, by, by the government. And I think it's always the government's aware how this development. If we look for Oman, I am not just because I am Oman. All the development starting in this, in this region, starting always from Oman. Why? For the, for the free election, usually it shows in the media sometime in the Kuwait or some places, but always the uh, open the, uh, the right for women for the, uh, the free election was starting in Oman. The first time appointed the minister in this region to be a minister is, was in Oman. Under secretary or ambassador, always the right for women or, uh, or free elections and uh, so it's like in Hidi, it's in, in one foremost country for actually for the reform and head step of, of the modernization. Thank you. Uh, I now have a question for both of you, and perhaps Hassan would, would start with his, his answer. And, and I want to take Egypt as my case study, but I think it's a question that may have broader, <coughs> broader application. <coughs> Uh, as recently as three months ago, the conventional wisdom was that an autocratic government was like a lid on a seething cauldron beneath that was dominated by, or at least had as its strongest component, uh, organized Islamist forces. In Egypt's case, the Muslim Brotherhood, of course, but it's an organization that has many offshoots and many branches or descendants in, in other countries around the region, <clears throat> and also in the United States, by the way. Uh, and today, events seem to have turned that conventional wisdom on its head uh, because of the extraordinary picture of so many people of different levels of religious belief and observance, and some who are quite clearly secular in their orientation, demonstrating together uh, the 
Islamist forces were not in the lead. As a matter of fact, apparently the older generation of leadership was very reluctant to join in in the first place. And the Muslim Brotherhood has announced clearly it's not even going to run a candidate in the forthcoming presidential election. And <laughs> now it seems as though the forces of civil society and just of, of society in general in, in Egypt are much more diverse and much less dominated by Islamist uh, forces and organizations than was believed very, very recently. Now, is this an illusion? Uh, is organized, is the organized Islamist movement in Egypt and elsewhere stronger than it's now manifesting itself? Is there going to be a third phase where they will become stronger as the new order is being, is being constructed? Um, actually, I made a distinction just uh, in my previous uh, answer between what is available in the marketplace of ideas and above the surface and underlying realities that we may or may not understand completely. The reason this distinction is important is because we have to realize that uh, the claim that uh, indeed autocracy was a check on theocracy for me to reuse the words that I used before. That was a claim that benefited both the autocrats and the theocrats. Mm -hmm. And in the process, kept quite a bit of the world public opinion hostage to this presumed duel, as if the Middle East is just a scene of a duel between autocrats who effectively are justifying cronyism and corruption, and between theocrats who would like to impose a totalitarian order. Um, actually, we many, including myself, but many have argued that the reality is far more complex, that the reality basically is that uh, Islamism is overstated in its power, that uh, here again we have to make a distinction between Islamism and Islam. The importance of Islam in society and for the individual and for the collective has indeed grown in the past several decades, and Islam itself had undergone severe changes, some of which are troubling in terms of its definition of uh, tolerance, in terms of its definition of the other, etc. However, this is distinct from Islamism as organized political movements that try to basically claim a monopoly of representing Islam and Muslims. Mm -hmm. Now, the fact of the matter, again, let's judge by the events the way that they happened. <coughs> For decades, Islamism was insisting on itself being the sole expression of, uh, of Muslims, of the, the, the political reality of Muslims. And for years, many years, at least 15 years, the radical Islamists have been engaged in a severe attempt at mobilizing the Muslim populations. They have succeeded in very few instances. For example, unemployed youth in Libya, in Tunisia, have actually paid their own ticket to travel all the way to Baghdad in order to blow themselves up and kill others, Muslims, mind you. You see, so that's a success for the radical Islamists. However, in 15 years of deliberate and persistent mobilization, they failed to do what a young man in Tunisia, who was by no stretch of the imagination Islamist, <coughs> did which is igniting a whole set of revolts. This is a young university graduate who was denied the opportunity to work. Again, Abdurrahman mentioned it in Oman, but it cuts across the Arab world. Yeah, that, that's Muhammad um, <laughs> uh, And then, I mean, he, he uh, re reverted to being a ve vegetable uh, seller. And then his cart gets confiscated and he demands to see the governor in order to, to vent his frustration at, at injustice. He's denied an audience with the governor, governor. So what he does is an act of self-immolation, which, by the way, goes against the tenets of not only Islam, but also Islamism. Because if he were a good Islamist, he would go and kill the governor, blow up himself, and <laughs> kill everyone else. Instead, what he did, he ignited himself. And as a result of Muhammad Bouazizi doing this, we have now, in an instant, you have the mobilization across Tunisia, and it moves from, from Tunisia elsewhere. And not, notice the flags. Again, I'll, I'll insist on inviting everyone to look carefully at the slogans and at the symbols, at the semiotics of these revolutions. In Tunisia, we only saw Tunisian flags. 
no Islamic slogans, no, no green flags of Islam, no nothing of the sort, just Tunisian flags demanding freedom, demanding justice. In Egypt, we saw Egyptian flags and Tunisian flags. Okay? Mm -hmm. Tunisian flags, because you, you are our inspiration, you went first, we go second. In Libya today, which took back the old independence flags, we see, we see Libyan flags, Egyptian flags, and Tunisian flags. Once again, no Al-Qaeda flags, no Islamist flags, no Ikhwan, no nothing. In Yemen, what slogans are they using in Yemen? The slogan that they used in Cairo. What slogans are they using in Bahrain today? Bahrain is a dramatic set of events are happening in Bahrain. We have to watch it carefully because contrary to these other places where you have so-called republics being challenged, Bahrain is a monarchy being challenged. And people are saying, we do not want monarchy, we want democracy. That's, that's crucial. The, 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 the wall of fear has broken. So in order to answer your question here, the Islamists ha are not, have not disappeared. They are there. They are as stunned as everyone else. This happened without us being the main engine. This is big. But the same way they benefited in the previous phase from uh, the, the, what, what is really an exaggerated dichotomy between autocrats and theocrats and nobody else, they are on the outlook, they would like to benefit from a new set of events. These, the youth today, youth and actually all generations that are on the street demanding democracy, actually demanding freedom far more than democracy, freedom, justice, um, are bound to make mistakes. The West is bound to make mistakes with regard to them. The Islamists are looking out for any mistake in order to step in and say we are the alternative. There is an attempt at claiming Actually, we're talking about Qaradawi. Qaradawi, who's uh, this Muslim cleric who uh, has tried to position, uh, was trying consistently to position him, himself as the most prominent Muslim cleric. He, he has made several attempts at trying to claim the revolution, as if the revolution is his. The fact of the matter, up until today, the Islamists are on the margin. They will step out of the margin and try to claim more, but it is not a done deal. Civil society, where civil society can organize, <laughs> will not simply hand in to the Islamist a victory. N neither are they in a position today to claim that they, they have an answer. It seems they do not, somebody else does. Thank you. Uh, Abdul Rahman, I'm going to put the same question to you, uh, but with a slightly different spin on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I say that because you are, among your other accomplishments, a scholar of religion mm -hmm. uh, in, in your region. and. Uh, I recently read a fascinating article that you wrote comparing the systems of religious education mm -hmm. in your country and in neighboring Yemen. Mm -hmm. And your argument, if I understood it correctly, was that the centralization of the religious uh, of, of education in your country had prevented the proliferation of independent schools that could be uh, conduits mm -hmm. for Islamist teaching, mm -hmm. and in particular, if I may be blunt, uh, Islamist teaching uh, subsidized by Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. You made the point in your piece that you, you know, Oman had deliberately closed itself off from mm -hmm. that religious mm -hmm. influence, and you contrasted that to Yemen, mm -hmm. where there was, mm -hmm. you know, where the, the government, for various reasons, some practical, some not so practical, had never tried or succeeded in achieving that kind of dominance over the system of education. And I thought you said that Islamist beliefs and tendencies in Yemen were much more powerful yeah. than they are in your country. But of course, Hassan is saying now that the uprising in Yemen is much more secular than it is Islamist, at least in its semiotics, in its slogans, etc. So, so what do you think is going on? I will tell you for two, two different answers. But it's the first is you, I can, uh, if we remember in 1991, during the collapse of Soviet Union, was the main theme was the democracy. Mm -hmm. Also, America was trying to apply it, and the West, especially in the Middle East, after the, because automatically the Gulf War, when Saddam Hussein uh, invents Kuwait, so the democracy was the way uh, for developing this region. 
But all actually the leaders of the Middle East, they mention the Islamist. So immediately American, they stopped for uh, requesting this uh, development. Then later again, after the September 11, uh, 2001, was the main five principle actually requesting to reform the uh, religious education and, and also one of the themes is actually the democracy. So again, the answer uh, actually about the Islamist only the opponents of this uh, government. Why? Because firstly, disappearance of the public opinions of this mm -hmm. in in this uh, in these countries, and and also uh, the the officials from the West when they came, they only hear, heard from one voice, so this is one unsuspectable. But we have to be careful because why America's this is came to them always in this uh, or in the West. I was asking many friends, especially the diplomatic. I don't want more in secular, uh, scholars, but I would like to be more in reliable answer. I ask many, uh, and until I found one American actually who used to be in, uh, in, uh, during the revolution, Islamic revolution in Iran. And I ask him, have you also was been among the being hostage in, in Iran, among uh, the American in Iran? I told him, why? Because as we know, that is American, Iran always close to the West, especially America and the British, since uh, during Ottoman period. That is why it's after the revolution, it came against America. And there is no reason. I mean, I don't find reason for Khamenei to mention or, mention or announce America is the great devil, or even he was, during Shah, he was in the West. So why? The, uh, I didn't find the reason. He said, after the revolution, it was by the nationalist. This is, was the mistake by America. America and Shah, he removed and he left. It was the power in the military. So during that period, this is a transformation period, we were afraid that this is nationalist immediately when they will take the power will be become close to the Soviet Union. So we prefer Islamist, perhaps they will be closer to American because this is atheist. So the Islamist perhaps will be close as we are in sharing values or in somehow Abrahamic religion to anti. But this is completely was a wrong situation. So I think Hassan, he is in his view, should be now how it's supporting this movement by nationalists to be closer, in fact, it's for the democracies, rather than to voice Islamist or who is going. But also we were afraid when Karadawi Wihin came to Egypt, in fact, and he also prayed with the Friday pray in the Medan at Tahrir, which is, was used to be the place. I was quite afraid to be the similar, same seminar which is used to be in Iran. <laughs> when Khomeini later and take actually, and they picked all what is being by, by Iranian. And, uh, but I think in, in, in somehow, why it is also for, in Oman is different situation, because why? The plan of the government has a, such a target. I, in my article I mentioned how the government deal in different perspective. Firstly, about the tribal situation, which is the structure of our community and society, on one hand, and also of the religious situation in the other hand, and also the other th things, how is the development in the countries. So it was com a completely different perspective in both the, the I mean, they are neighbor country, but has different perspective for the development. And that is my view. So I am not suspecting the Islamists, only the Islamists if they took the power so the, through mm, uh, removing the others, so it would be the troubles. Well, if, I, if I may add here, I mean, which it's, it's interesting to see uh, what kind of adjustments there has been in terms of Islamist discourse mm -hmm. lately since these events have happened. Again, they are very indicative of where the center of gravity of political thought in the Middle East is today.
Uh, we know that there are two types of Islamists, very broadly speaking. One that we term radical, that insists that there needs to be a cut with uh, any system that is non-Islamic by their assessment. Another that's accommodationist, that says that we can take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and we are Islamist in the sense that Islam ultimately is our aim, but the tools we use to get to Islam, that's a different question. The, the main public mass movements, if I can use that term, Islamist mass movements in the Middle East are accommodationists. The Muslim Brotherhood is the, the main example. It, the Muslim Brotherhood would use democratic tools, but ultimately its aim, as it states, is the Islamization of society, of the individual, of family, of the state. Um, it's interesting to see how consistently throughout the, the Arab world today, how the Muslim Brotherhood is repositioning itself. All of a sudden, it's, in, it's now it's stressing the fact that it accepts democracy. It's stressing the fact that to, to it, it has always been okay, uh, okay to have a fusion between Islamic values and democratic values. This is a dramatic shift from what was before, which is we use democracy as a means to an end. Now democracy is an end, which underlines the fact that the center of gravity of political thought and political expression in the Middle East has moved away from Islamism. That brings me to my final question, but I can't, but before I get there, let me just repeat and underscore something that Hassan said in his answer to a previous question, because I think it poses a question for all of us. You noted that the rhetoric being used, the key nouns, if I may put it that way, are freedom and justice, but not necessarily democracy. You might even add in dignity, yeah. uh, but not necessarily democracy. And so I just want to put a question mark there that members of the audience may want to pick up or that you may want to pick up in your answers. But let me, let me bring you to uh, to my last question before we open the floor up for, for a broader uh, range of questions. Uh, I mentioned in my introductory remarks that there are four questions. And the fourth is, well, what does this mean for the rest of the world, for the United States, not only the United States, and how should we respond? And there's the sort of the microcosm of a single country and also the, the, broad, <coughs> the broader picture. Uh, as you know, there is now a great debate in Washington about our appropriate response in the case of Libya. Uh, and in today's Wall Street Journal, you had an op-ed by Richard Haas arguing very strongly against the wisdom of intervening in any way, starting with the no-fly zone or escalating from there. And then from Brett Stevens in the previous page, you had a very strong <coughs> argument in favor of intervening. And you know, Stevens went so far as to argue that there is a danger that the most ruthless autocrats and dictators in the region will survive. And the ones who had a tincture of conscience will be the ones who disappear. Mm -hmm. And that the remaining rulers in the region will draw the conclusion that it is better to be harsh and pitiless you know, than it is to show any kind of restraint at all. He asked, is that the kind of message we want to send? But Richard Haas makes a very powerful argument on the other side. So, starting with Libya, but not necessarily ending there. First Hassan, then Abdul Rahman. Uh, you know, what are the implications for the rest of the world and for the United States? Um, the implications are dramatic in every respect. Let me very quickly address the issue of democracy. I think that democracy is understood as being a corollary of freedom. But uh, at least this is in, in terms of uh, not just the sloganeering, but uh, of, of uh, the expression as it, it formulates itself, as it's growing. However, the immediate demand is a freedom, a freedom from fear in particular. And I think this has already been achieved not only in Tunisia and in Egypt, actually across. The reason we can have protesters in Bahrain, again, I, I restress Bahrain because it's an important little kingdom because it's almost like a canary uh, there in, in the, exactly, in the mind. Uh, uh, calling for democracy as opposed to monarchy, contrasting democracy and monarchy, that's an extremely important statement. However, 
the implications, when I say that the implications are dramatic, it's not just in terms of our uh, analytical framework that allows us to uh, um, uh, try to decide who to engage and to what, to what extent we can engage. Actually, there needs to be a lot of soul searching in terms of Washington, in terms of the West in general, with regard to Libya in particular, because the Qadhafi regime is one of the most ruthless regimes on earth, if not the worst. It has committed an uncountable amount of atrocities in the, in the course of its many decades of existence. And nonetheless, when it shows a little sign that it's willing to postpone some of its mischief, we engage it as if it's okay to engage it. This makes us responsible today Indeed, I agree with the judgment. I actually, I, I tend, in the case of Libya, I tend to think, indeed, if we let Qaddafi survive, that's a good sign for Ahmadinejad, for Hezbollah, and for others, that the U.S. can do nothing. And the stronger you are, the, more, the, the harsher you are, the better. We have to figure out a way, maybe not by sending our troops, but we have to figure out a way with the Arab League, with the African Union, with others, in order not to let this regime use a machinery of death that we are partly responsible, actually in more ways than one, we are largely responsible for its existence because if we have not sold the weapons to Qaddafi, we have bought from it oil to enable it to buy the weapons elsewhere. We cannot ignore the fact that the, we have a responsibility when it comes to Libya. How we deal with it is a different story. But beyond that, the, the lesson number one of all what we have witnessed in the region is that it is time for us to harmonize, to, to put together our values and our interests because ultimately they are one and the same. We have been in bed with, one, uh, with some of the worst characters in the region under the claim that, well, you know, the contradiction between values and interests are such that we have to preserve our interests. Guess what? They were unable to deliver. They will not be able to deliver down the line. It is time for us to have a policy that is clearly driven by interest, otherwise it will not be policy, but that is informed by values and, and that identifies the region for what it is the societies for what they are, and that engages those societies, engages members of those societies on the basis of shared values, because there's plenty between our values and theirs. Share. In the case of Libya, <clears throat> I think if you remember, always uh, everybody, if you and we ask about the Clintons uh, during his uh, period, the most his involvement in during the Balkan, when he preserved actually Europe, not just even the Balkans, and for humanitarians uh, was the main case of his during his uh, period. And I think it's now is the time for Obama to involve with Libya, because uh, I why I mentioned Tunisia and uh, Egypt and Morocco. It is immediately after the protest for two weeks, the president here, he moved. I mean, he, he left the countries peacefully. But in Libya now, it's, it's a quite a strange tragedy. It's, it's a huge war. I think it's the time. This is the case for Libya. It's completely different. It's uh, according to the society, because he also destroyed the society and uh, infrastructure in Libya over his regime. The second thing is about more interest about uh, in America is if we took the player, shift the place from Egypt, of course, they immediately they announce about their interest to America. Now to the Gulf. The Gulf, I think it's uh, the movement, uh, Hassan, he actually mentioned Bahrain. Bahrain has different situation. This is always repeat. Why? Because the, the society is actually divided between Sunni and Shia. And uh, there's quite a, a huge number of the Sunni Shias there, and actually in 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 a, most of them in uh, it is not that is in in a good level of either in education or in employment or something. This division also is in Yemen. So the stability is in effect in both place, but in my view, actually, um, all these states in the Gulf will need America for the future. For why? All these places, America has interest for their actually American military bases. Started from Iraq, from Kuwait, in Bahrain, in Qatar. 
But all these places, in fact, actually need a miracle. Bahrain, for example, during Shah, when it was independent in the 70s, Shah claimed that is Bahrain is a part of Iran. So actually, observed by America and by British uh, softly, then America is actually the pace. Then the second scenario actually is, was uh, cases in Kuwait. Saddam Hussein invent of Kuwait, in fact. So he claimed that is Kuwait is a part, is from... Yeah. The 19th <laughs> province. Yes. <laughs> Which is the case of Qatar, always a problem with, with Saudi Arabia. You know, is the, 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 actually the coherence border between Emirates and Qatar actually is taken the part from Saudi Arabia and divided the two countries now. <laughs> Qatar now, after the American military base, they actually they have the most important media in the Arab world, which is Al Jazeera. Mm -hmm. As this Al Jazeera cannot be actually uh, done without this American. <laughs> so somehow, I am not from different, perhaps I am not the same because I am paired them. But actually, either now or in the future, they will need. And what's the important things now, also for the future, we all actually, as we suspecting that now is the shifting for the struggle, is it will be in the Indian Ocean, which is a huge big game for all the globally. So this will be a main part of the global for this game. Fascinating. Well, gentlemen, you've put an extraordinary number of ideas in play during the first half of our program. Now it's time for the second half.